All right, welcome back everyone. We're gonna start off with a little meditation period again tonight, about 20 minutes so you can get yourself settled. We can begin by knowing what it feels like to be present. Knowing how natural that feels. Just to know our own experience, know what it feels like to be human. We can also remember that we've remembered a lot already today to value awareness, to value presence, sensitivity, intimacy, and that already says something about our confidence in awareness. And right now, we're just renewing that. Remembering that we value being present, being attuned. such an honest way to live. Not only is it such an honest way to live, but it's also really natural. It's natural to be aware. You might even notice that awareness has its own momentum. There's so little effort we need to make. Just remembering that we value presence is enough. And this confidence supports moment after moment of awareness. In fact, we can see that awareness is just happening naturally and intuitively wisdom knows how to support it. You might just be curious about this, how intuitive wisdom is without any personal effort. Wisdom just knows. Relax a little. And 
Does the mind even know to linger with an anchor or a few breaths? Wisdom might know when that's no longer needed. Remembering to value awareness supports its naturalness. When wisdom becomes natural like this, it's the body, the heart feel relaxed. And it's possible not to get involved in stories or dramas or plans. Awareness knows this cognizing, doesn't take it personally. So let's continue in this way, just noticing how little effort is needed, just the effort to remember that we value awareness, how little effort is needed to support the naturalness of awareness.
And opening your eyes when you're ready, coming back into the space with everyone. Feel free to stretch your legs or move your body a bit. So I'd like to share some reflections tonight about wise effort and about the Eightfold Path and where wise effort falls into the Eightfold Path and hopefully make this applicable to the style of practice that we're um, engaging in for these eight days together. I really like talking about wise effort. It's been a very important teaching for me over many years now. And it's also, I feel like it's a confusing teaching. It, it's confusing the application of wise effort, especially in a very, um, intense world and you know, where we can see a lot of suffering around us. It can feel confusing to know how to apply our efforts and what that actually means. There are too many things to do and too many needs. And so this teaching really calls us to um, explore what we really value and both surrender to the wildness of life and still take responsibility for our participation with the wildness. And this wise effort is a persevering effort, the effort to be more continuous because of this high value we place on awareness or presence or intimacy, many words to describe what we're pointing to and what you can actually feel. All of the Buddhist teachings can be found in the Noble Eightfold Path. This is the fourth noble truth, the way the, in this fourth noble truth, the Buddha points us to, points us in the direction of how to live a good life. And not just a, a good life, like how to live a good life, but how to shift our perspective in order to understand suffering. And when we understand suffering, we can help ourselves, right? We can know suffering and the end of suffering. So why is effort in the Noble Eightfold Path? It's a whole path factor. So we can tell it's important. There's just eight of these. And it comes first in its little group. So it's an important one. And one of the reasons why it's important is because when cultivated, it leads to the other two path factors in its group. And this is kind of how the, the Noble Eightfold Path flows. One path factor is a supportive condition for the next. So wise effort then supports wise mindfulness and wise mindfulness supports wise concentration. Or we might say wise continuity. And in the study of wise effort, we can see that some things are under our agency. We do have some say in how we live and how we practice. And we can learn to find a balanced way forward, balancing both interest and surrender or relaxation, the surrender to the way things are. And the te the teachings on wise effort help, help us tease this out. What is balance? What supports a steady and persistent engagement, a steady and persistent participation, a sustainable participation in our lives, with our own hearts and minds, with each other, in the work that we do, and the things that we care about? And our usual relationship to life is that you know, things that are unpleasant in our hearts and in the world, we tend to want to fight or blame or brace against, or we want to fix or change, right? And it's not a problem to uh, 
anticipate or or even yeah an anticipate is a good word what lies ahead for us though we can never be sure right we do make plans because that's a skillful thing to do and neither is it a problem to want to change or fix the things that you know aspects of our lives or of the world that that we know could use our support right injustice any kind of injustice working for working towards justice is a really good thing and engaging in action ethical conduct the way we live our lives gets a whole third of the path so sometimes you know buddhist buddhism can be condemned for like maybe being too passive or something but that's not in my understanding the buddhist teachings the Buddh the path is inclusive of all our entire lives is to support us in all the things that we do right to support the way our internal cultivation the way we live in harmony or not with each other and the wisdom to support our um sustainable or sustainability in in living in aspiring to live in good ways and we can also learn that suffering is endless like mark was talking about earlier so getting to the end isn't a worthwhile goal so then what is the sustainable way forward and we're actually practicing this on retreat right now you know we might not know it all the time it might feel we might not uh, see the balance in the completeness and the way we're living but we're cultivating ethical conduct and living in harmony with ourselves and or with other people and at the retreat center and even in our homes right now and we're cultivating the mind a capacity to be aware to be present we're becoming more continuous with that and we're we're remembering we're remembering to sh to shift our perspective and live in non-intuitive ways right to bring wisdom in to lean into that which is difficult which is painful even unpleasant and to see the traps of the beauty and also the traps of pleasant experience right because habitually human beings want to push away or get rid of that which is unpleasant and we want to hold on to which is pleasant and in doing this you know there's some like uh, innate or um, primal instinct to do this that we you know feels really appropriate and we also see that as a, a frame for our lives there are traps in all over the place right we can't build a cocoon of safety things are too unpredictable and too wild for that and so this non-intuitive reframe that the noble eightfold path actually teaches us is that we we do counterintuitive things like lean into which is that which is unpleasant because we want to see what we can learn and we learn to enjoy what's enjoyable of life knowing that it will end and to support a balanced heart and mind and we also learn how subtle it is that our actions and engagements can be motivated by any of the flavors of greed aversion or delusion and some of us we've expressed in our small groups that retreat can be frustrating right because we sit down with some really sincere intentions to be aware to cultivate compassion and kindness and to bring in wisdom and recognize it and yet our minds <laughs> don't behave the way we want them to right and so we learn that even 
the subtle we learn both the subtleties of these energies and how they creep in the wanting mind just creeps in before we know it we're irritated or something like this and then it doesn't shift and we we finally ask like what's going on here sweetie and then we see like a subtle belief that's there that's a, a bit of wanting that's pushing everything forward right we see the subtleties of these energies that that um, cause us to get stay stuck in loops like this and we also learn to feel it because feeling the pain of greed and aversion of any kind and delusion the confusion of the mind human beings we we don't get it right feeling that is where the heart learns that's not intuitive to just feel any of these places where our hearts are stuck and when we learn to connect in this way and do this non-intuitive pivot right to engage our life and the activities of our lives and the energies that move and flow through the heart when we learn how to do this it not only supports our own health and well-being because any flavor of greed aversion has an, an immediate impact on our bodies right when we're worked up angry rageful it has an impact there's no denying that and we can also see that these energies have a profound impact on the collective right virtually all of our systems and structures are in some ways motivated by greed by aversion or by delusion and there's lots of suffering caused by that and so not only are these being coming in contact and learning how to relate wisely relate with some skill right not only is that important for us and our lives and our our small circles of our families and our communities but also has a great impact on the collective and this was the is what the buddha was interested in understanding how this whole this complete path the internal cultivation and all its integratedness how that when we are wholehearted about this about this cultivation then it really supports all living in the world that we want to live in so this movement towards a different perspective is about leading with a sensitive heart and learning that we can fully engage and should take actions to alleviate suffer suffering for ourselves and others I was at teaching at IMS this summer and um outside the there's a big grassy area outside the door where staff goes right into the staff dining room so there's a lot of traffic there and a path where lots of people walk you know he's do walking practice there and right on the grassy um area by the path by the road there's a big tree and it got struck by lightning some time ago not that long ago and you can see where the lightning wrapped all the way up the tree it's a big groove all the way up the tree and and a big hole in the road right next to it and apparently the lightning bounced off the iron fence and and so you can see where that it split the iron on the on the fence area as well and you know I, i just imagined walking by this every day and how many people have noticed that and i too paused and looked at the lightning and just with the reality that anything could happen at any time and on this one particular day walking from my cabin to the staff dining hall to begin the day it just it really hit me like oh everything anything could happen at any time and i noticed that by the time i got in into the center that my heart was a a bit more sensitive right i greeted 
the people in the staff dining hall, hall with a, a little more attunement. And I even felt inclined to go into the office and say hello to the staff and pause there for a second and ask how they slept. And it didn't feel like a special thing, but it was obvious that the wisdom that was there, that anything could happen at any moment, then supported the, the sensitivity, that integratedness of wisdom and sensitivity that really took that in and the sight. And then it led to, you know, a really a supportive action. It didn't feel personal. It just felt like cause and effect. And so this is just how the path works, right? In really ordinary moments. And when we get practiced in these ordinary ways, then we we begin to just live in 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 beneficial ways for ourselves and each other. So these three parts of the path, the wisdom part of the path, wise view and wise understanding. Oh wise view or wise understanding and wise intention mm -hmm. is about shifting, really shifting our perspective and realizing that our views and beliefs are often invisible to us and they shape our lives and lead to suffering. And that with practice, we can, um, pra we can practice with healthy and skillful views that also shape our lives and lead to more harmony and um, good living. And the second part of the path is relational and ethical. And it's all related to how we are in relationship with one another, wise speech, wise action, wise livelihood right here. And then this third part, part of the path is about this internal cultivation, developing wise effort, wise mindfulness, and wise concentration or continuity, as Sayada Utejaniya likes to call it. So wise effort. Wise effort asks us to value sensitivity and to make efforts to feel so that we can know the suffering here and now related both to the unwholesome and unskillful mind states. And so that we can know the good feeling in the heart as it re is related to wholesome or healthy mind states. So non, so greed, aversion, delusion, any, anything associated with those would be, we would call those unhealthy, right? Not useful to ourselves and each other. And we can feel that on the heart when we connect with sensitivity. And then wholesome mind states would be non-greed, non-aversion, non-delusion, or non-greed, we might call that mind states or um, emotions that are related to generosity or um, non-aversion like love and compassion and kindness or non-delusion, wisdom and clarity. So generally when we feel bad, we wanna blame someone or something, but instead we're making a choice to feel it instead, right? The heart is learning how to feel, how to feel the unskillfulness that's there. You know, the unskillfulness of, of anger or the unskillfulness of impatience or the unskillfulness of irritation, you know, whereas these might be really natural human tendencies, true and appropriate, right? And activated, when activated, they will arise. When we actually care to feel them, we know like this doesn't feel good right now. This doesn't feel good on this heart. And when we watch ourselves not take care of the heart when it's under the influence of these unskillful mind states, then we can see, oh, wow, well, this doesn't actually lead to good and healthy living for the people I love either. So these four wise efforts, and the first two are about taking care to uh, yeah, be simple so that 
unwholesome mind states don't arise, right? We're like protecting the heart in some ways. We're learning to be attuned and intentional and sincere in our movements. And so that we're, we're, we can really know how we're living and we can protect the heart from the arising of unwholesome mind states because we're there and we're present. And then when these unwholesome mind states arise, we learn to feel them so that the heart learns how to be touched by that suffering and naturally learns to let go. It's not something that we actually have to do. This is the effort, like sometimes the effort that we make is a little bit too much, right? We're trying to get somewhere and that's, the, that's influenced by greed. But instead, all we really have to do is feel, right? We have to feel with some sincerity. We watch something come and go and the heart learns from it. And then the next two uh, wise efforts are, to, are about wholesome states of mind or skillful states of mind. And the first one is to cultivate directly wholesome mind states like wholesome emotions like metta or compassion or equanimity or wisdom or awareness. And then to learn to linger in the wholesome so that the heart also remembers what it feels like to live in this way, to be touched by these energies, to learn that, oh, wow, that being motivated by compassion feels a lot better than being motivated by rage. It actually feels different on the heart, right? It's not just for other people. It's not just to solve problems, right? But it's actually because the feeling is right here and we can learn that because we can feel it. Sayada Utejaniya says, when we do something repeatedly, momentum will build up naturally. That's natural effort. Right. So when we repeatedly cultivate sensitivity or awareness, and that awareness gets strong, it builds up momentum, it notices, it no, it's really good news to notice the unskillfulness that arises in the heart, right? It notices that unskillfulness that learns to linger there, be touched by it. It learns that energy is just energy, it just moves, it doesn't stick, right? In the same way, when awareness or sensitivity connects and feels the warmth or the lightness of metta, the warmth of care, the warmth of patience, then, and, and it feels that, then it also develops some mo momentum right there. Right? One moment of awareness then seeds another moment of awareness. Awareness gets stronger. With time, you're probably noticing this already as you're practicing on retreat. So we might say that wise effort is about learning to participate skillfully with our experience, right? But not appropriate, not hold on and appropriate like it's ours, right? Not take it personally. We see that each moment arises, each experience arises out of its own habits out of its own conditions, causes that have supported it. This is wisdom. And although we don't have control, we do have responsibility. So we participate skillfully right there in a moment with our experience. We're always making effort like this. And sometimes we can think that if we avoid, we do our best to avoid, then, you know, we'll become the people we want to be. But we forget that avoiding is also a way of making effort. Pretending that we're not participating is also a way of making effort. So this path is about making effort in really brave and courageous ways to feel all of life and to be able to stand up with it. Right? So that we, we're always deepening into an understanding of suffering and the end of suffering. We know because we can feel it. And now when we can feel it with our own hearts and simple moments, like with simple irritation or simple wanting, right? A little bit of impatience or wanting the, the sun to stay out a little bit longer than it, it is or to come out for the day, right? When we 
practice in these very simple ways, then we can learn how to uh, show up when things are more complex, right? We might say that awareness is the natural state of the undefended heart. A heart that's not defending itself, not trying to hold back, avoid life in some way, not trying to stay away from people that that we feel that we perceive as difficult or that we don't like, not trying to avoid the messy world in any way. But we're cultivating the competency of heart to be undefended and be alive, right? Right there so that the integratedness of the path can then move in every way that we want it to throughout our whole lives. And we might encourage the heart to be undefended the way we might encourage a child with a lot of love, some steadiness, consistency, resolve, balanced effort, balancing a kind of mm, uprightness or an urgency maybe to support a child so that they don't get hurt, but also a really patient and receptive awareness of like, oh, this child is just learning. There's one, uh, a couple of stories in the suttas that I really love. And one is of this musician, Sona, a popular story. Sona was a serious practitioner with a lot of resolve. And as the story goes, he was practicing until doing walking meditation until the soles of his feet were bloody. And I sometimes, rem- yeah, I just imagine these stories and like real people, sometimes with a playful attitude, I imagine them just to make them come alive and so Sona was walking and his feet hurt and he started to have doubts about practice and was like, you know, maybe I'll just hang this up. I'll just go back and I'll work with my family and I'll make a good living and I'll do good things with it. And maybe that'll be good enough. And the Buddha arrives right there with Sona and this, in this sweet relational moment, the Buddha doesn't condemn, condemn Sona at all. He doesn't it's like, no, you're doing it all wrong. You know, he doesn't say that. But he reminds Sona of something that he used to love. He says, Sona, remember you used to be a musician. And when you were a musician, you used to string your instrument, right? And if you strung your instrument so that the strings were too tight, the music didn't resonate. And if the strings were too loose, the music also didn't resonate. And in here, the Buddha is teaching Sona about effort, like making effort and in a kind of sweet way, right? Not in a condemning way, but also, you know, in a way that Sona can relate to. And we all have we all have our ways of relating, our ways of learning. They're going to be slightly different for each of us. Like some of us might really, at the last retreat, you know, somebody was really learning a lot from pulling weeds in the garden. And this person had a lot to say, a report about it. And it was, a very, it was like very moving, right? And some of us have, might have a lot to say by raising children. And others have a, might have a lot to learn and, and say about practice and learning through activism and so many other things, right? Some of us are musicians too. And when I did a little research to understand the sutta a little bit better, I came across a discussion and um, the people were talking about instruments in, in India at this time and how they were all, as you can imagine, they were all handmade and from natural materials and they were made specifically to fit a particular body, right? So they were all slightly different. And the strings were probably not made out of plastic. Uh, I mean, they were obviously not made out of plastic, but more like some handmade rope, right? 
So it wasn't like you could just quickly uh, tune your instrument. You would have to like hold it and be with it and really listen to it and the way it sang or didn't resonate or didn't with the body and with the rope and the quality of the rope and the age of the rope and and all of this right and this is the way we listen to our hearts with this kind of embodied wholehearted sensitive sensitivity right learning how to make subtle adjustments sometimes we make a little adjustment in practice and we can listen for a long time and other times we need to make more con consistent adjustments you know again and again and again we might have to take a deep breath we might have to open the eyes we might have to remember that there's a body and remember again and remember again and remember again and sometimes we just hit a nice stride where we remember and you know, mindfulness, awareness just kind of hums along on its own. And so this is the art of meditation, right? This learning to listen, learning to apply effort to be persistent and yet relaxed, and to really care about the mind, to care about what's what seeds are being planted, what's being cultivated so that we can feel and so that the heart learns how to set down and protect from planting seeds that aren't gonna be beneficial. And so the heart learns how to cultivate directly and plant seeds that are gonna really be supportive and beneficial in our lives. This is poem and um, this book of poetry called The First Free Women. It's a book of um, inspired or poetry inspired by the Terigata, which is this little book of um, poetry composed by the first free women at the time of the Buddha, the first awakened women at the time of the Buddha. So this book of poetry is inspired by that. And there's this one poem I'd like to read it to you to end with. When everyone else was meditating, I'd be outside circling the hall. Finally, I went to confess. I'm hopeless, I said. The elder nun smiled. Just keep going, she said. Nothing stays in orbit forever. If this circling is all you have, why not make this circling your home? I did as she told me and went on circling the hall. If you find yourself partly in and partly out, if you find yourself drawn to this path and also drawing away, I can assure you, you're in good company. Just keep going. Sometimes the most direct path is in a straight line. Let's sit for a minute or two and let go of the words. <laughs> 